Welcome to Texas Heart Institute educational programs on innovative technologies and techniques. The purpose of these presentations is to inform and educate physicians, allied medical personnel, and general public on the latest advances in cardiovascular medicine. I'm your host. My name is Von Verkrazier. I'm an interventional cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute. Our special guest today is Dr. Brianna Costello. She's an international fellow at Texas Heart Institute and Baylor. And Dr. Costello, welcome to this program. Thank you, Dr. Krasier, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to our talk today. The topic is May Turner syndrome or iliac vein compression syndrome. Dr. Krasier, to start, can you briefly describe the anatomy and the natural history of this syndrome? Well, uh, as we mentioned, uh, this is commonly known as May Turner syndrome but also it is known as Crockett syndrome and also iliocaval compression syndrome. This syndrome was first described by a German pathologist, Rudolf Ludwig Karl Werho, in 1851. He was a well-known pathologist that identified this particular problem uh, to exist uh, on his uh, evaluation of uh, patients uh, after tragic events. Interesting. So can you describe a little bit more about how he found this syndrome or how this was identified? Was it all post-mortem on autopsy or? Right. This was a post-mortem analysis and uh, really it uh, didn't uh, become well known for almost uh, a century after that. Interesting. Very so interesting. Uh, in uh, October of 1957, two individuals, again, pathologist uh, May and Turner, described in the Journal of Angiology uh, this particular condition, again, repeating the same description that was described by Verhal. Mm. And they uh, call it iliac vein compression syndrome, and they identified that the problem occurred because the iliac artery compressed the iliac vein. And namely, they described that the right iliac artery was crossing over the left iliac vein and cause, causing this uh, compression syndrome, which is described uh, here and shown clearly in uh, their pathological analysis. Dr. Krasier, it's pretty, um, here just with the illustration, you can understand why the left is often more um, involved um, compared to the right side. But I know that you've mentioned in the past that the right side can also be involved, the right iliac vein. Um, have you seen that frequently, or is it pretty uncommon? Uh, of course, the most common scenario is uh, the left uh, uh, iliac vein compression by the right uh, common uh, iliac artery, but there are many other scenarios. And actually, uh, May Turner, or May and Turner, described this clearly, and they found it on uh, 430 cadavers that it occurs somewhere between 22 to 30 percent of cases so it's a very very common occurrence not only that it causes compression but it can also produce a lot of other complex and problematic scenarios such as thrombosis of the iliac vein and also a lot of fibrotic changes and scarring and spurring as is shown here after the thrombus uh, disappears so obviously this is a very very common problem that is present uh, in a huge number of uh, mm -hmm. individuals uh, in the United States as if it occurs in 30% uh, of female population and about 20% of male population, you can imagine that millions of people mm -hmm. have this type of a problem and consequences related to this particular problem. So we just touched on this a little bit, the incidence is, you know, 20 to 30 percent. Um, and do you think that we underdiagnose this because not many people are looking for it? Yes, this syndrome is uh, obviously grossly underdiagnosed because mm -hmm. the great majority of patients do not have symptoms mm -hmm. or they do not have symptoms in their early stages of May Turner syndrome. And uh, the only time when it's really typically diagnosed is when the problems happen, mm -hmm. such as thrombosis or uh, DVT of the lower extremity mm -hmm. or uh, problems uh, related to chronic venous insufficiency, which this leads to. Mm -hmm. So I would say probably no more than maybe 5% of patients with uh, May Turner syndrome develop symptoms at one mm 
stage of their life, but uh, when it happens, it could have serious consequences. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it is very important to identify it early to prevent problems uh, that could happen later. This is particularly of importance in patients that uh, have a hypercoagulable syndrome because mm -hmm. they are at higher risk, also females during pregnancy, or individuals that undergo various type of surgeries, particularly abdominal surgery or even the lower extremity surgery. They are at significant risk of thrombosis and uh, problems related to DVT and also chronic venous insufficiency. So, um, you know, touching a little bit more on this, in pregnancy, in women that are pregnant, do the symptoms usually arise during pregnancy or is it after pregnancy or is it mostly just clot related? Um, for example, do they have significant left lower extremity edema out of proportion to the right when they're pregnant if they have this disorder or is it just post um, delivery they have more of the issues? Well, as, as I mentioned, uh, this uh, compression occurs in more than 25% of healthy individuals. As I mentioned, it's more common in female population and male population. And this obviously has to do something with anatomy. There is a much steeper angle between the lumbar spine and the pelvis or coccyx in female mm -hmm. population. And of course, it also <laughs> is related to pregnancy and compression that occurs in addition to uh, compression that is present from uh, the right common uh, iliac artery on the left uh, iliac vein. So this obviously plays a significant role during pregnancy. So a lot of individuals during pregnancy will have findings and classical symptoms of leg edema, mm -hmm. more pronounced in the left lower extremity, and evidence of uh, venous insufficiency, but also it presents itself with uh, thrombosis. Right. And that is a challenging uh, situation because uh, any intervention in this type of a scenario has mm -hmm. potential complications and consequences. Absolutely. All right. So, well, Dr. Krasier, we talked a lot about the, the right common, you know, iliac artery on the left vein. What about other places that can be compressed in this syndrome? What other areas of the venous system? Here we have uh, listed all the possible scenarios. Of course, the most common one is uh, proximal um, uh, left uh, common uh, iliac vein, but uh, as we can see in this schematic drawing, the iliac arteries can compress iliac veins either on one side or the other side or both sides at any location. Of course, uh, that certainly has more serious consequences when we have several areas that could be compressed uh, from uh, that particular anatomic variation. All right, so now that we kind of know what this syndrome is, what are the tests that are used to diagnose it or to evaluate the problem? Typically, obviously, the most important part is to talk to the patient, evaluate patient symptoms, evaluate patient's findings, and uh, once you see problems related to a pronounced, unexplained left leg edema, uh, evidence of varicose veins, uh, or even uh, teleinjectations, you have to suspect a possibility mm -hmm. of May Turner syndrome. So, of course, we start first with very simple, non-invasive, uh, readily available tests such as duplex uh, mm -hmm. ultrasound evaluation. Of course, uh, one has to have expertise in this because uh, it is um, not easy to diagnose and establish proper diagnosis uh, unless you have a significant experience in evaluating those patients with May Turner syndrome. There are scenarios where this is more challenging, uh, such as in patients that uh, did not have adequate preparation for mm -hmm. the ultrasound, uh, and also morbidly obese patients as well. But duplex ultrasound, as we will see, is a very reliable and uh, useful tool in doing a non-invasive evaluation prior to proceeding with more invasive or more costly type of procedures such as contrast venography, uh, CTA of the abdomen and pelvis, uh, magnetic uh, venous resonance uh, evaluation, and then finally intravascular ultrasound that we typically use during the intervention. 
Very good. So what's, what would be your initial approach uh, for any patient that you suspect has the iliac vein compression? Do you automatically do a Doppler or are there patients you know, that come into the office and have a clear-cut story that you're convinced is May Turner and you go right to the MRV or the CT? I always proceed with uh, non-invasive evaluation mm -hmm. using uh, uh, Doppler and one has to uh, uh, pay attention and recognize what are the normal values and yeah. what are the abnormal values. For instance, we know that the inferior vena cava is typically more than two centimeters in diameter and common iliac vein should be at least one centimeter in diameter or larger as we can see here. We can see uh, normal findings as far as uh, uh, the ultrasound image is concerned, but also as far as Doppler images are concerned. Another thing that we use very frequently is uh, phasic flow, because if you have no compression, you will have a normal phasic flow during inspiration, expiration, and valsalva maneuver. And that is very important uh, step in evaluation of patients with this condition. Then as we move forward, uh, forward uh, with additional information from the duplex ultrasound, we can look at other parameters such as uh, extrinsic compression, which is seen here on the left uh, upper uh, corner image, uh, and this is with color Doppler, as we can see here. There is a significant compression of the common iliac vein, and so what are the abnormal values? Obviously, more than 50 percent the diameter reduction is considered significant. Also, uh, changes in velocities, uh, more than 2.5 to one ratio between a normal segment, abnormal segment, and turbulent flow with mosaic, as we can see on the right-hand side, is another important uh, parameter to take into consideration. We also uh, measure the velocities proximally and distally, so that is very, very useful as is seen here on the bottom image. And of course, so of course we can do polymetry, which is very important as far as identifying the severity of stenosis. You have to measure it uh, in the segment that's narrowed as well as proximally and distally as well. And then there are several other what we call indirect criteria for detecting iliac vein obstruction using duplex ultrasound. There is so-called non-phasic or asymmetric flow in a proximal common femoral vein. There is also non-phasic low or no flow on augmentation with Valsalva. It means that obstruction is so severe that Valsalva cannot augment the flow. Mm -hmm. There might be also a reversed flow in the ipsilateral iliac um, vein and a difficulty in compressing common femoral vein because of such high mm -hmm. venous pressures as we can see here. All of those parameters are very important. And then we have also additional indirect uh, criteria that we could use, presence of collateral veins that are easily identifiable on the duplex ultrasound as well as on angiography as we can see here. There is a cephalod uh, flow in the inferior epigastric vein mm -hmm. which normally is in the opposite direction mm -hmm. so that has to be evaluated as well. And then there is a reverse flow in the deep external pudendal vein mm -hmm. which is again very unusual and abnormal observation. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So um, we talked a little bit about the ultrasound and the duplex studies. Um, when are MRV and CT indicated for, for this you know, diagnosis, or what do we find usually in patients with May Turner when we have these uh, studies? So we use uh, MRV very frequently. We less frequently use CTA, mm -hmm. particularly in female population in, in childbearing age because it mm -hmm. adds extra radiation. And MRV obviously doesn't have that risk and here we can see two images, one in a, in a view where we can see the, clearly the compression on the left-hand side from the MRV of the iliac uh, vein, and the other one also we can see the anatomical uh, finding where the right common iliac artery is totally compressing left common iliac vein, and actually there is an obstruction, there is no flow this uh, vein is completely thrombosed and we can see extensive collaterals uh, here that are connected uh, as we can see to uh, the flow up higher which is actually in this particular scenario the ovarian vein. So uh, both CTA and MRV are very very useful and uh, meaningful tools in further evaluation.
We can see furthermore, uh, as far as CTA is concerned, on the left upper panel, uh, mild compression from the iliac artery, and on the bottom panel, more significant mm -hmm. compression of the iliac vein from the iliac artery. And then on the right-hand side, the lateral view, we, we can see, uh, again, significant compression of the iliac vein from uh, overlying uh, iliac uh, artery. Another image here, we can see, again, uh, compression that causes dilatation uh, of the iliac vein due to that compression, or so-called pancaking. And on the right-hand side, actually, when we remove uh, the overlying uh, iliac artery, we can mm -hmm. see indent indentation mm -hmm. in the left common iliac vein. So all those tools are uh, extremely important uh, in evaluating patients uh, with this particular condition. All right, so that's very interesting. Um, now tell me more about when we're in the procedure or when you're in the procedure, um, how do you use intravascular ultrasound to guide you in your intervention and tell us the steps that you take for pre and post intervention? So IVUS, in my opinion, is extremely important tool. It's almost a mandatory tool during the intervention mm -hmm. because it will give you a detailed information on the location of the compression, the extent of the compression, and the presence of collaterals as well. And uh, also it will guide you as far as uh, selection of uh, interventional tools such as stents, mm -hmm. what size stents uh, should be used, and also on the outcomes uh, after the stenting is mm -hmm. performed. As I mentioned, stents are routinely used for this type of condition because plain oil balloon angioplasty is inadequate mm -hmm. and you will not achieve satisfactory results uh, with the balloon angioplasty alone. Very good. So a little bit more on the um, stenting. So there are a couple of venous stents now on the market. Can you tell us a little bit about those and what um, sizes we might have for those or maybe the difference in the, you know, build the makeup of those stents if you choose one over the other for um, May Turner in particular? Um, and then what generally do you send people home on in regards to any medication-wise antiplatelets or anticoagulation? Um, if you could just briefly summarize, I know it's a lot to talk about there. Well, a little bit about the history of stenting of the iliac veins, particularly related to the May Turner syndrome. Uh, this started in the early 90s, mm -hmm. and at that time we only had one large stent available for this particular application. It was wall stent, mm -hmm. and it comes in various sizes from very small, let's say, 8 millimeter diameter to a 24 millimeter diameter. Mm -hmm. So larger wall stents have been or have been used for that particular scenario. For the last uh, four or five years, particularly abroad in Europe and now more in United States for the last uh, several months, we have dedicated stents that were specifically designed for this particular use. They are self-expanding stents and they are uh, uh, precise as far as placement is concerned, which is uh, mm -hmm. advantageous uh, in comparison with the uh, wall stent, which sometimes uh, gives us challenges mm -hmm. in placing exactly where we have to. For instance, wall stent typically is placed uh, protruding into the inferior vena cava just to make sure that we do not uh, um, have a difficulty in uh, assessing where the main compression is. While newer stents, and there are two of them available on the market in the United States, they can be precisely placed in the location where the compression is. Mm -hmm. Of course, the guidance is with the ultrasound and also determining the um, location and uh, the outcomes is using the ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a few uh, examples, uh, and we will show this in one particular image, but uh, our optimal goal in stenting iliac vein is to achieve a round uh, type of a, uh, end result mm -hmm. rather than ovaloid end result. There is now evidence with recent publications that uh, round type of uh, expansion of the stent is preferential as mm -hmm. far as preventing uh, restenosis or thrombosis. Mm. So the diameter by itself is not a good mm -hmm. indicator. Actually, proper expansion is more important. And that 
is uh, achieved with uh, newer generation of stents that have a significantly higher radial mm -hmm. force. Very good. Very good. Um, so now that we talked about the stenting um, and the you know what we have available to do that, what is the follow up of these patients after you stent them? Um, are you repeating duplexes? Um, you know, six months, one month, three months to check on the patency of the stent, or um, just going by symptoms? Uh, the classic uh, treatment uh, that uh, <clears throat> I think is the most appropriate for the great majority of patients, unless there are contraindications, is uh, we use antiplatelet agents for at least uh, two or three months, mm -hmm. but we also uh, use anticoagulants. Mm -hmm. uh, more frequently, uh, recently, NOAX, but mm -hmm. before uh, warfarin. Uh, however, when there are contraindications to anticoagulants, such as pregnancy or whatever, mm -hmm we will only use uh, antiplatelet agents. Typically, uh, anticoagulants are used uh, for at least three months, maybe six months, particularly in patients that had thrombotic <laughs> event and uh, or complications related to that. So uh, I think that's a probably standard of care for a great majority of interventionalists as far as May Turner syndrome is concerned. Very good. Um, we touched earlier on contrast venography. Um, in your use of IVIS, now that IVIS is pretty mainstream for treating these lesions, what, what can you say about your experience in the past just by doing procedures with uh, venography alone versus now doing it with IVIS? Um, venography is obviously a suboptimal test mm -hmm. as far as assessment of severity mm -hmm. of obstruction in May Turner and also um, as far as uh, management of patients uh, during the intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, as we can see here on this particular image, we can, uh, we can see that there is probably suspicion of compression, but we cannot assess uh, the severity of obstruction. This is particularly true in anteroposterior type of imaging, but if we do it in the oblique or lateral mm -hmm. projection, there are certain scenarios where this might be more visible. Of course, the gradients are not important as well because venous uh, pressures are very low, mm -hmm. so that's not very meaningful. We frequently see so-called pancaking, mm -hmm. as we have seen on the previous one, or flattening of the vein. There might be some stagnation of flow. There is a contralateral cross-filling and a preferential collateral flow, as we can see here. Mm -hmm through the paravertebral uh, uh, vessels and stenosis and presence of thrombus. All of those things are useful, but they are not extremely uh, beneficial in uh, guiding us as far as size of the stents or uh, mm -hmm. location of the stents and all of those things mm -hmm. that are very important in the treatment of patients with uh, iliac vein compression syndrome. Now, just interrupt for a second. The the significant collaterals that a lot of these patients develop over the years, because they were most likely had this syndrome since they were born, um, after you stent them and fix the obstruction, do those collaterals go away? They're not used anymore? And then is there any implication for those shutting down? I have seen scenarios where a collateral's vessel disappear instantaneously oh. after appropriate um, stenting of the iliac veins. So yes, they can disappear. Some of them will disappear a little bit um, slower. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly if there are also other comorbid conditions or associated conditions present, such as uh, uh, ovarian vein insufficiency mm. or uh, the nutcracker syndrome yeah. and compression in other areas that could be playing a role. Very interesting. So um, we talked a little bit about IVIS, and I think um, it would. These pictures are pretty telling at what you were saying about the ovaloid shape versus the circular shape. And this, after you put the stent in, um, this one here on the right seems to be the more optimal round shape um, stent. Right. So uh, yeah, the, the, here we have two perfect examples mm -hmm. of on the left hand side suboptimal expansion mm -hmm. with a stent on the right hand side optimal expansion. Mm -hmm. And that should be done routinely with the IVUS at right. the end of the procedure. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, different stents offer different 
type of results. Mm -hmm. On the right hand side, we can see a very good result with the later generation mm -hmm. stents and suboptimal result in a patient that had a practically total occlusion of the iliac vein mm. and uh, suboptimal expansion. So that is very important as far as long term outcomes yeah, are concerned. Certainly. Um, can you summarize now, after we touched on all the imaging modalities and therapeutic options, um, the role for, you know, in the future after these patients leave the cath lab, um, if you use this, you know, venography or CT or MRV or an ultrasound, um, or if you have them follow up at all, or if the symptoms just uh, dictate what you do? So typically what we'll do, we will see the patient at one month follow-up mm -hmm. and we will obtain a duplex ultrasound. We will compare the findings with the previous one that was performed prior to the interventional uh, procedure. Very good. Uh, this particular tool is extremely practical. It's inexpensive, has no side effects, mm -hmm. and is easily repeated. So I will do this on a routine basis. Uh, what we didn't mention before, and it's important to mention, in every patient with iliac vein compression, we will also look for any finding of uh, venous insufficiency or regurgitant valves or venous incompetence in the lower extremity. Hmm. We will assess this pre-procedure and also after the procedure. Occasionally, we will see almost complete resolution of venous insufficiency if the valves are not grossly deformed wow. and distorted after adequate expansion of the iliac vein with stenting. Now, some of the patients will continue to have chronic venous insufficiency and symptoms related to it because the veins have been stretched to the point of uh, no, no return. return. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> again, uh, duplex ultrasound is extremely important. Very good. Now, as I mentioned, IVAS is the gold standard for measurements as far as location is concerned, diameter, length, stent selection, and assessing the results during the procedure. Other imaging modalities that we mentioned, such as uh, CT and MRV, are also very useful, but obviously we cannot use them during the intervention, so IVOS would be the most appropriate one for that particular very purpose. Good. All right, so the bottom line is who, um, at least in your mind, actually needs the intervention, the stenting of the iliac vein? Are there clear-cut guidelines or is it, you know, I know there's a, it's a gray area for those patients who maybe have symptoms but have never had a thrombo thrombotic event. Um, what, do you, what do you generally do for practice? So this is a very kind of debatable mm -hmm. uh, type of a situation. There are no clear-cut guidelines. I think that most of the experienced operators uh, would agree that uh, only patients that have symptoms should mm -hmm. be treated. Mm -hmm. So it's not for cosmetic reasons or not even for anatomical reasons because there is compression of the iliac vein. Typically, um, the patients will be referred to us because they develop thrombosis, mm -hmm. uh, either during pregnancy, after pregnancy, with trauma or with surgery. That's the great majority of patients. The second subset of patients that are referred to us are patients that have chronic venous insufficiency and mm -hmm. symptoms related to it. And we see it in a lot of families. Mm -hmm. We have seen that where every single member of the family has findings of chronic venous insufficiency of the left lower extremity mm -hmm. with the diagnosis of May Turner syndrome. And then the question is, who should be treated? Again, only those that have symptoms. First, we'll try uh, medical therapy, exercises, weight reduction, mm -hmm. elastic stockings. But in patients that have a severe stenosis and persistent symptoms, we will resort to stenting. stenting. And then, if needed, treatment of chronic venous insufficiency, which is easily treated on outpatient mm -hmm. basis under local anesthesia without any surgery or incisions. Very good. All right, so can you give us a recap um, of everything we kind of talked about, you know, from who gets it, who needs workup, and then ultimately who needs, you know, who needs to be referred as an, out, you know, as an outpatient provider? Who, who do you need to think of to send to a cardiologist or, a, you know, interventionalist to help your patients? Well, as I mentioned previously, only a small number of patients with 
complications related to May Turner syndrome will require treatment. Iliac vein stenting is essential to achieve good long-term results. And now we have dedicated iliac vein stents, and uh, I think that uh, the treatment uh, for this particular condition is better, will mm -hmm. be better than it has been in the past. Yeah. So I'm quite optimistic that uh, we will um, be able to treat those patients in the best possible way. Yeah, stent technology seems to really be improving, especially um, in the venous side, which we didn't have options for before, which is great. Well, Dr. Costello, thank you very much for participating in this program. It was a pleasure to have you here. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me.